Hello. In this video, we're going to explore the uncertainty principle and specific restrictions that quantum mechanics places on what we can know and what properties we can know about physical systems. So, in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, um, we're talking about, first of all, this is the basic principle that was first elucidated by Werner Heisenberg um, in his exploration of quantum mechanics um, at the outset. Um, we have a principle that relates the uncertainty in position measurements, which is represented by delta x here in this equation, and momentum. Um, according to this principle, the product of the uncertainty in position, delta x, and the uncertainty in momentum, delta p, must be greater than or equal to h-bar over 2. So, what that means is that we cannot know both the position and momentum of a particle exactly, uh, with arbitrarily high precision, um, simultaneously. Um, we can only know them with specific uncertainties. The ins because the uncertainty product must be greater than or equal to h-bar over 2, um, if we know the uh, position uncertainty, um, then we can calculate the minimum uncertainty momentum, um, but it cannot be zero. Um, if we know the exact position of a particle, for example, let's just say that delta x would be equal to zero. In that circumstance, that would mean that we know exactly what the position is because the uncertainty is equal to zero. Well, if that's the case, the only way that we can satisfy the uncertainty principle is for the uncertainty in momentum to be infinite, uh, meaning that we can know absolutely nothing about momentum. Um, so if we know one exactly, we can't know anything about the other. In general, of course, we're going to have um, uncertainties associated with any measurements that we make. Uh, but in this case, this is a fundamental uncertainty beyond restrictions placed on the measurements in the laboratory and the measurement instrumentation. This is, let me repeat, a fundamental uncertainty, a fundamental limitation in what we can know placed on the system by quantum mechanics. It doesn't matter how precise our instruments are. It doesn't matter how well developed they are how good they can be um, in the future, we will never be able to know both of these, position and momentum, exactly at the same time. This is just a fundamental limitation according to quantum mechanics. So this is, this is actually fairly important, um, as we're going to see. Um, and it really is, as I say, going to place some severe limitations on what we can know about systems. Um, again, compared to classical mechanics, we don't have this limitation. The limitations in classical mechanics are based on our measuring methods. But in quantum mechanics, again, I cannot emphasize this enough. It doesn't matter how good we are at measuring something or how precise our instrumentation is. We'll only be able, be able to get to a certain level given by these uncertainty relationships that we're going to be talking about throughout this video. All right, so let's let's take a look at this a little bit more precisely. Um, you know, we've got this relationship that relates the uncertainty in position and the uncertainty in momentum, um, what we can know about position and momentum, uh, but what exactly do we mean by uncertainty? Well, we'll place a more precise definition of this. Um, we're going to replace the delta x with a sigma, um, which you'll recognize as a symbol for standard deviations. So if we want to be precise about the definitions of uncertainty, we're talking about the standard deviations. So that the standard deviation of momentum times the standard deviation for position must be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Alright, so, and how do we calculate the standard deviations? Well, we talked about that in statistics. Um, but just here's a very, uh, very specific definition of the standard deviation squared, also known as the variance for a system, um, as being equal to um, the difference between 
the mean square value of a system of the measurement and the mean value squared. Um, that difference is equal to the variance uh, for the particular uh, position, uh, momentum or position or whatever it is we're measuring in the lab. Okay, So let's just look at some specific examples here so that you clearly understand what we mean by mean square and mean value squared. Um, so let's just say we make a series of five measurements. One, two, three, four, five are the values that we've got here. Um, and if we square those values, of course, we get this column of numbers here. All right. So what's the average value? Well, the average value of this measurement A is going to be equal to 3. Uh, we can ask what the mean square value is, and that's going to be the average of these square values. And in this case, if you work it out, it's equal to 11. So then we can ask what the standard deviation is. The variance is going to be the difference between uh, the mean square value and the mean value squared, which is 11 minus 3 squared, or 11 minus 9, and that's equal to 2. So the variance is equal to 2, and the standard deviation is equal to square root of 2. Um, so I hope this helps you understand what we mean by these particular um, terms, the mean square value, the mean value squared. Um, and the only time that, of course, we will have a situation where the mean square value and the mean value squared are the same, meaning that the standard deviation would be equal to zero, is if we actually had the same, got the same value in every single measurement in the system. All right, so that's what we mean by uncertainty, and that's how we're going to apply that uh, when we deal with the uncertainty principle. Okay, now the uncertainty principle specifically showed a relationship between what we can know about the position of a particle and its momentum. All right, there's a more general relationship uh, between any two arbitrary uh, measurements of properties in, this, in, in the lab. So let's say we're trying to measure properties A and B, and we want to know what the uncertainty relationship is between them. And that's very simply given by this specific equation containing an integral, um, where this little term here in the brackets um, is referred to as a commutator. Um, and it's given by this relationship here where the A hat and the B hat represent the operators corresponding to the two observables, the two properties we're trying to measure in the lab, A and B. So you can see from this relationship the commutator just simply um, changes the order in which we operate on the system. Um, the commutator AB operating on a wave function psi means that we take the operator B and operate on psi first and then we operate on that result with the operator A and then from that we subtract A operating on psi then B operating on that. So we just simply reverse the order of the operation and take the difference between the two. That's how we determine a commutator. Um, so for example, let's say that we get a situation where the uh, order of the operation doesn't matter, meaning that A, B, Psi is the same thing as B, A, Psi, and that's equal to zero. Um, in that situation, uh, we say that our operators commute, um, and that also means that our integral is equal to zero. So when these operators commute, we find this integral is equal to zero means the uncertainty relationship between the two observables A and B um, is equal to zero and in that case um, that very simply means that we can know both exactly at the same time. So unlike the position and momentum uncertainty relationship, the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship where we couldn't know both to exact um, values with zero uncertainty simultaneously. If the operators commute in this situation here, um, then we can know that. So these uncertainty relationships will depend on the specific observables. As we go through and look at different systems, um, we'll see that there will be times when properties that we measure in the lab uh, will be limited by these uncertainty relationships, but not always. So this would be a situation, again, if the, if the uh, commutator um, uh, is equal to zero, 
then the operators commute and there are no limitations on what we can know about those two properties at the same time. Now, what if it's not equal to zero? Uh, well, if it's not equal to zero, then of course the integral is not equal to zero, and that means we are limited by an uncertainty relationship, um, and that means that we cannot know both the simultaneously um, arbitrarily high or exact position, uh, ex exact measurements at the same time. So, so when the commutator is not equal to zero, we can't know both exactly at the same time. And the observables that are linked by this under those circumstances are referred to as complementary observables. So position and momentum, as we talked about earlier in this video, are complementary observables. We can't know both exactly at the same time, and that must mean that their commutator is not equal to zero. And we'll take a look at that shortly. All right. In fact, we're going to look at it right now. So let's take the um, momentum and position operators and ask what the commutator is in this, in this circumstance. So here's the commutator, um, Px, representing the operator for momentum, and x representing the operator position for position. We're going to operate on psi. Um, and so here's our operator for momentum, and here's our operator for position. Um, and we're going to see, of course, that when we do this, we're going to simply just first um, take x times psi and operate on that, and then we're going to take x operating on p psi, um, and that's how we're going to go about determining what the commutator is. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we have it written out um, where we have the momentum operator operating on x times psi, and then we have x operating on the momentum operator with respect to psi. So we're, we're asking, okay, what's the difference between these two? All right, well, let's look at the first term here, um, and this is where we're taking the derivative of a product. And when we do this, we have to, of course, use the product rule. The product rule, if you'll recall, means that when we take the derivative of a product, we take the result is, uh, for example, the derivative here of f times g is equal to f times the derivative of g with respect to x plus g times the derivative of f with respect to x. That's the product rule that you should remember from calculus. And, and that, again, is, is certainly what we have done here. We have x times the derivative of psi plus psi times the derivative of x. All right. Well, we can see here that dx with respect to x, the derivative of x with respect to x is just very simply equal to 1, um, and that does simplify things greatly. Um, and so we just have, as a result of that, uh, because that's equal to 1, that second term, this becomes psi. And so we look at the overall now result of this. Um, when we take the first term and plug it into our relationship up here, um, this is what we get. All right, so if we take a close look at that, we'll see that this x d psi dx, which is in the brackets here in the first term, will cancel out with the second term because we're subtracting it. They're identical terms, so those two terms cancel out, and we're just left with psi. And so the overall result is our commutator operating on psi is equal to h bar over i times psi. So that means it is not equal to zero, as we said before. When the commutator is not equal to zero, that means we have complementary observables, and those two observables, in this case position and momentum, are limited by an uncertainty relationship, which we've already talked about um, earlier in this video, but now we're looking at the mathematical derivation associated with it. Um, and so here we go. We're going to take that result of the commutator. We're going to take our general definition with the commutator inside the integral here. Um, and we're going to replace that with h bar over i times psi. Uh, of course the h bar of i being a constant can come outside the integral and we're left to psi star psi d tau. Assuming that our wave functions are normalized in this circumstance 
that integral then is just equal to 1. And we're left with the relationship that we derived earlier. Now you may be asking, okay, I see how the h-bar over 2, because there's an h-bar there. I can see how that comes about. Um, but what happened to i, the imaginary coefficient? Well, we've got absolute values here. The little uh, bracket bar around it means we're talking about the absolute value of this particular um, uh, relationship. Um, and so the absolute value of i um, is, is just 1. So in this particular circumstance, it just becomes 1. And we, res we end up with the result here of the relationship between the momentum and the position uncertainties being greater than or equal to h bar 2, which is exactly what we specified at the very beginning of this video. Okay, so we just looked at the relationship between position x and momentum in the x direction. What about position x and momentum in the y direction? Do we have a similar limitation in what we can know about these two observables? Um, so to do that, of course, what we need to do is evaluate the commutator, x and p hat, the, com the uh, uh, operator for momentum in the y direction, um, to determine whether that's equal to zero or not. Um, I will leave that up to you for an exercise that we'll be talking about in class to make that determination. So the question here is, I know I can't know x and px at the same time. They're limited by an uncertainty relationship. But can I know x and p sub y, the momentum in the y direction at the same time? So we'll need to evaluate the commutator to determine that. All right. Uh, we can kind of get an idea by looking at the wave functions here. And this is another exercise that we'll be working on in class to show this. Uh, but let's look at, at the superpositions of wave functions. Uh, we've got a wave function here, um, psi, uh, which we're saying is a sum of cosine functions, um, where n is the number of functions in this particular superposition. And the probability density, of course, because this is a real function, it's just psi squared. So if we plot the probability density of these cosine functions uh, for different values of n, so we have, uh, in this particular case, we've got n equal to 1, so just one term in the superposition, two terms in the superposition, five terms in the superposition, 20 terms in the superposition. If we, t if we plot those, uh, we can see an interesting evolution of our wave function. So the one term um, gives us a very broad, it's this outer um, wave function here. We see a very broad peak in our wave function for one term. Uh, for 20 terms, we see a much narrower peak. All right, so if, if we look at those two, and, and I asked you the question, uh, which of these um, corresponds to greater uncertainty in the position of the particle? Um, your natural answer should be that the one that's broader Remember, we're talking about probability density here. So these, these graphs represent the probability of finding a particle in a particular region of space. You can see that the one-term uh, wave function is much broader. And because it's much broader, there's more uncertainty in the position of the particle. Um, that we're, for example, very likely to find the particle out, out here in this position, or we could find it out here. Um, there's a high probability that we're going to find it in certain locations um, in a very, over a very broad region of space. Compare that to the 20-term uh, function, you can see it's much narrower. So based on these, we can see that the one-term function has a much greater uncertainty in position than the 20-term function. And we'll see that in general, the more terms we have, the narrower it gets so that the more terms in this superposition, the more certain our position will be, or the less uncertain our position will be. Okay, so we can see there a connection between the number of terms and the uncertainty in the position. Now let's ask a question about momentum. All right, How does the number of terms affect the uncertainty in the momentum? Well, if we go back to our discussions that we've had several times 
about cosine and sine and the relationship to these imaginary exponential functions, uh, the cosine function can be written as a linear combination of uh, e to the k pi x and e to the minus k pi x. So it's a two-term function. Um, you should recall that these exponential functions are eigenfunctions of the momentum operator. So for the e to the i k pi x, um, the eigenvalue, which is the momentum corresponding to that, is k pi h bar. And for the negative one, it's negative k pi h bar. So for t each cosine term, there are two possible outcomes to a momentum measurement. All right, so let me, let me add that. Let me repeat that. For each cosine term in our superposition, there are two possible momentum outcomes. All right, that's important to know. All right, so how does that relate then to uncertainty? Well, so in a one-term function, there are two possible momentum outcomes. So we actually are, we know we're either going to get one or the other. And so there's a high degree, there is, while it's not absolutely certain what we're going to measure, we have a reasonable degree of certainty about two possible outcomes. So when we have one term, we had a much broader function, remember. Our wave function, again, for one term was broad, and our position uncertainty was high. So we had, for one term, a high un position uncertainty, but a fairly small momentum uncertainty. But as we add more cosine terms, that means there's more possible momentum outcomes, and the momentum uncertainty increases. So when we take a look at these functions, and what do we see? We see that more cosine terms means more momentum uncertainty, but it means less position uncertainty. So with 20 terms, we had a more certain position than one term but we had a much, much less certain momentum. So we're seeing this general relationship here that's consistent with the uncertainty principle because as the position uncertainty decreased, which happened as we went to more terms, our momentum uncertainty increases, and that's what would be dictated by the uncertainty principle. As the uncertainty in position decreases, the uncertainty in momentum must increase and vice versa. If the uncertainty in momentum decreases, then the uncertainty in position must increase. And that's borne out by these superposition functions. Um, so just one last thing here. Um, I did the previous uh, um, slide in MathCAD, and again we'll be looking at that in the, uh, in the classroom, uh, but you can also graph these in Wolfram Alpha um, using the command here by plotting two different terms. Um, you can actually see, and, and you can add more terms to this, you can get the same sort of result for these two um, terms. You can see that, again, this is a two-term function, which is just the cosine pi x plus 2 pi x over 2, and then we had this one-term function. So you can see the same kind of uh, results associated with this that the one-term function um, has a greater position uncertainty than the two-term function. So this ends our discussion of the momentum uncertainty. Um, we'll be certainly seeing uh, momentum position uncertainty and the uncertainty relationships in general. Uh, we'll certainly be seeing uh, more examples of these complementary observables and what we can know about systems. Um, specifically with respect to electrons, when we get to a discussion of atomic systems, we'll see some, some very important results that come from these uncertainty relationships.